With this video, I look at uh, students' explanations for ionization energy in different topics within uh, Chapter 7. This is based on research I've done over the years, and uh, it was a talk that I gave at a conference a few years back at NARST. To begin with, what do scientists do? Constructing explanations is an important part of it. We time and again see the aim that we want our students to become scientifically literate. Well, what does that mean? It means offering, amongst, uh, amongst other things, it means offering explanations. Having students construct explanations allows them to participate in a core scientific practice. This is something that scientists do. The benefits, while it could alter their image for what they think uh, science consists of, there's also uh, evidence that it increases their content understanding. So having students construct explanations, that's a good thing. Unsurprisingly, Various reform efforts advocate for this. Having students apply concepts and construct explanations are key objectives. Now, I've used the word explanation a couple times. So what is an explanation? An explanation is a rationale in which the conclusion represents an accepted fact. And the reason is, and the reason represents a cause of that fact. If we contrast an explanation with an argument, they sound similar, but they're different things. An argument's going to answer the question, well, how do you know that? An explanation answers the question, why is that so? The explanation begins with the notion that there is an accepted fact. And now we're going to look at the reasoning for what causes that. Within this chapter, the kinds of accepted facts are, well, what do, what do the data tell us? Things about the size the ionization energy, the electron affinity, these atomic properties are accepted facts that we're going to now seek to provide explanations for. The reasoning for that, well, we need to understand what the phenomena is, the underlying causes. Many times it's complex as we have multiple parts to this argument, multiple parts of the explanation, I guess I should say. And many times there's also a competing framework that seems to provide a reasoning, but it's not a scientific one. So in my study, I wanted to make sense of how students make sense and offer explanations for atomic properties. And when it comes to their explanations, I can think about it in different ways. Does the explanation communicate an understanding of the underlying phenomena? And what are they using within that to construct their explanation? So within my course, it's a uh, traditional story progression where chapter seven, looking at the peri periodic properties of the elements, is about halfway, two thirds of the way through the course. The same topic could appear earlier in an Adams first course. But when I look at its treatment in different textbooks, it's largely the same. When it comes to explaining trends in atomic properties, the uh, work by Ruth Wilden here, I think, is a really concise summary for what's going on, how we want to think about it. That this system of nuclei and electrons is held together by our electric forces, but quantization restricts the possible configurations. We have protons, we have electrons, there's attractions and repulsions, but the electrons are still going to be found in atomic orbitals. The description she has here I think is a really good description for the factors that I want us to be considering. And they're the same ones that are consistent with the treatment within my textbook. The same treatment of thinking about attractions and repulsions, the effective nuclear charge, the electron-electron repulsion and aspects of shielding. This is what's being used to provide explanations within this chapter. I've looked at then students' perspectives on this in different ways. This was a question I used where I was seeking explanations for atomic size, and I did this before and after the first semester. So you see the question there at the top. So description is given for sulfur and chlorine, and it says even though chlorine has an additional electron, its atomic radius is smaller. Explain why. So when I categorize the responses, it's an open uh, response question, when I categorize them both before and after the semester, these would be the 
groups, the categories that emerged. The blue columns, those are uh, the classification before, and the red columns afterwards. There were quite a few different categories that emerged. I've set this up where the ones on the right, to me, these are the more advanced explanations, the more complete explanations where there's a consideration of the protons and the effect of nuclear charge. So when I'm looking at this, I don't necessarily view this as a simple progression left to right, but I think that the best explanations are including those features that I show on the right-hand side. What kind of competing explanations are there? Region and octet, you see, was persistent both before and after instruction. Now, what do I mean by region and octet? Because with a smaller radius, it's somehow easier to gain the eighth electron needed to complete the outer shell. This explanation here, which is one that a student voiced, is trying to connect somehow reaching an octet with a description for why we see this difference in size. This naive framework, the idea that, well, everything is explained by octets, very persistent throughout chapter seven. Somewhat in between those, is it about the octet, the pattern of the electrons? or something about the protons was descriptions involving the electrons themselves, where the number of electrons was crucial. For an example, in this case, the number of electrons is greater, and they have a greater charge, and this attracts the protons, the nucleus, better. So this one, instead of thinking about the charge in the nucleus, it's about the description of the electrons. I find this common as well, because within Chapter 7, making sense of the chemical phenomena based on the number of electrons, based on the electron configuration, it works many times. And because it works, it gets reinforced. The student is not seeking a different part to explain. They're not thinking about the uh, protons. They find that, oh, well, it sort of worked this time. So I think just by looking at the electrons is sufficient. When I think about, well, can, can I change their... Uh, a student's perspective, can I change what they're using within their argument? I have here listed, did their initial explanation focus on octets, number of electrons, or number of protons? And then when I looked at afterwards, was there an improvement that's shown in green? They offer pretty much the same, or they regressed in some ways. So you see, if the initial explanation is in terms of protons, that's great. That can then be shifted from protons to effective nuclear charge pretty readily. You notice if the initial explanation is predominantly in terms of, well, tell me about the pattern of the electrons, that was more difficult to see a shift towards an improvement. Number of electrons, once again, that's definitely seeming like a barrier. And I come back to this idea that these students are very proficient at determining the electron configuration and drawing different patterns for periodic trends on the, on the periodic table. A lot of these are not considering, when they're drawing arrows on the periodic table, the student isn't seeing the number of protons. They're looking for patterns based on valence electrons. They seem to work, and therefore it's difficult to move to a stronger explanation. Now, how does this fit then with ionization energy? This is an instrument, a test that I really like from Keith Tabor. It presents this representation of a sodium atom, a shell model. And then it asks different questions as far as how to interpret ionization energy from there. This reference, very helpful one, it includes the, um, uh, the actual instrument. A lot of good questions to consider using uh, with your own students. When I did this with my students, I had a large number of uh, people participate, nearly 500. I found it really remarkable, or maybe I shouldn't, how closely it was aligned with the data that he had. So this is the percentage correct. Blue was uh, my group of students. Red was what he reported. Time and again, really similar across both of them. Both groups of students strongly agreed that energy is required to remove an electron from the atom. That's a good thing. As T Tabor notes, the whole notion of ionization energy is only meaningful if we have this understanding. 
what would be quite low, both with my students and in his study, statement like this. The atom would become stable if it either lost one electron or gained seven electrons. That's a false statement, but the students find it quite compelling. Again from Tabor. Students have this alternate notion of stability. It's all about reaching octets. If the sodium either removed one electron or added seven in order to reach that, it's all about the stability of this outer shell. That really seems to be a shorthand. That's what the students are looking for. I would pause for a second and it's somewhat baffling as a chemist. Sodium as a seven minus anion? What in the world would that even mean in terms of stability? There's no possible realm I can think of where I would be describing that as stable in any ways. But many students, majority of students, are looking for this pattern of reaching an octet. Now, related to that, this is a question that I've used, another open-ended one, several times. Explain why the ionization energy for a hydrogen atom is closer to the values than the halogens than the alkali metals. Experimentally, that is true. What is now the explanation for that accepted fact? This is my explanation as I think about hydrogen, the alkalis, and the halogens. First of all, when we say it's closer to the values, it's a large value for hydrogen, it's a large value for the halogens, it's a small value for the alkalis. When I think about the features of, tell me about the effect of nuclear charge in the distance, hydrogen and the halogens are reaching that large ionization energy in different ways. With hydrogen, small charge, just one proton, but it's a very short distance as that electron is found quite close to the nucleus. The halogens, they have a very large effect of nuclear charge. There is a contraction as I move left to right across the periodic table due to that larger effect of nuclear charge. That's what's giving rise to it, those having a higher ionization energy. The alkalis, small effect of nuclear charge and a larger distance as we populated a larger principal quantum number. I know why this is a complex question because there's not a simple explanation. It's the same factors of charge and distance, but we're reaching those in different ways for hydrogen versus the halogens. Now, also competing is, what does it mean to reach a noble gas? Hydrogen, after all, is just one electron away from being stable, from reaching a noble gas. That's also an aspect that I see within these student explanations. So I broke them down in different ways. First of all, I grouped the uh, responses and I looked at students that had a strong understanding of electrostatic forces. By strong, I mean they scored 100% on these questions on Tabor's instrument. When I looked at the nature of their explanations then, about half of them were in terms of electrostatic forces. A sizable number still wanted to talk about adding an electron, and there were a few other descriptions as well. What do I mean by a complete explanation? This was a very complete explanation a student offered. I see a description of hydrogen, the valence electron being found close to the nucleus, a lack of shielding, a description of how all of this is leading to a high ionization energy, contrasting that with the description of the alkali metals, and then describing in the same terms of effective nuclear charge, the high ionization energy for the halogens. Very complete explanation throughout here. These same students that had, had a strong understanding of electrostatic forces also found compelling at times, though, what did it mean to add an electron? Within this description right here, we see the student's description. It's all about the description of the valence electrons, how there's the need to add just one more electron to complete that um, S sublevel. And that this was similar to the pattern that they were seeing for the halogens as well. This was being expressed as a desire to complete that outermost level. When I look at the kinds of explanations the students that poor, scored more poorly on Tabor's uh, test had, on those same set of four questions, either missing all four or only getting one out of the four correct, 
I saw a larger proportion offering explanations include based on adding a hydrogen, uh, adding electron to hydrogen. The numbers that were involved in electrostatic forces much less, and very few had complete explanations. Thinking more about what does it mean to add an electron to a hydrogen atom and use that to explain the ionization energy, there's a lot going on there. What they're saying is if you add in, if you somehow add an electron and that leads to stability, therefore the opposite of it must be very difficult. Ionization energy, after all, is not talking about adding the electron. It's about removing the electron. Fascinating to me that students are making a connection and somehow saying, well, if adding it would be beneficial, then removing it must be difficult. Not the case at all, but you can, you can get in their head and see that logic. Hydrogen only needs two electrons to become stable, whereas the alkali metals need eight. Notice how it's all about achieving the octet, even if we're asking about removing the electron. What, what do I mean by other descriptions? Something like this. The hydrogen atom has only one electron, so therefore it's very difficult for that hydrogen to lose it, because then it would have no electrons. Now, we know what's ahead. We're going to be looking at H+, plus or the hydronium, time and again. Fascinating to see this resistance of saying, well, you don't want to get down to zero. These explanations here could be thought of as being uh, teleological. They're being expressed in terms of some kind of purpose that is being served. That purpose is often in the language of becoming more stable. They're not returning to the physical principles that are uh, relative for this phenomena. They're in terms of there's some higher purpose, some want or desire. I've tried to address it, that point this way. So imagine this scenario. Let's say you're trying to push this boulder off the cliff. It could either fall down a little bit or it could fall down a lot. It could end up having differences in potential energy when you push it off the cliff side there. Is it easier somehow to push the boulder off if it falls down for farther and becomes more stable? Is the final state of something easier to do, it makes, makes something easier to do if it leads to greater stability? I try to sort of bring this scenario into the class. Does the boulder know at all where it's going? No. It's just about the force that you have to have to push it in the first place. This is how I've sort of tried to address that. What does it mean to push something away where it takes a force of some kind? Is it easier to do if that object then falls to the floor versus getting caught halfway? I don't think it is. This is another very standard question. This one was posed open-ended. Why is it easier to remove a 2p electron from oxygen than from a nitrogen atom? This one also is expressed quite often in terms of wants and desires. About half of the responses were in that category. About wanting to have an equal number of electrons. Or somehow the rationale that octets are good, half-filled is also good too. This idea that half-filled shells are going to be better with no additional explanation, it's again students reaching for a pattern. And of course, this idea of things becoming more stable means it's easier to do, persist as well. Taking an electron from the oxygen would cause the atom to become more stable, and that makes it easier to remove. A few last thoughts to wrap up. These questions were within my homework system. What I always see is this pattern of as we get closer to when they're due to the due date, you get more and more submissions along the way. I looked at the nature of the submissions and when they were um, provided. I put them into different bins. So I looked at the submissions to see, well, are they telling me more or less based on the word count? That ended up being relatively the same. But what about the nature of the explanation? Students that were explaining things in terms of being half filled, that became more and more common as we approached the deadline. 
the more complete explanation of electron repulsion became less and less. This is something that they found in other aspects of science education looking at explanations. Not the idea that, I don't know, weaker students could provide things closer to the deadline. It's just the way our brains work is we get closer to the deadline if we're pressed for time. A lot of times the more naive explanation is what pops into our head in which, and that's what we provide. So in conclusion right here, as we think about periodic trends on the periodic table, I think that it's very important to understand the phenomena and the underlying causes. And the underlying causes will have competition with a conceptual framework that is looking for patterns and is language of stability, neither of which are really addressing the underlying phenomena. The periodic table and the student's use of it, which is, let me look at patterns for the valence electrons, it really seems to support this naive conceptual framework. It's looking at the patterns of valence electrons and asking about, well, what needs to happen to become an octet? What needs to happen to be half-filled? This often leads to anthropomorphic in these teleological explanations involving purpose, wants, and desires. I would argue that a stronger understanding of the underlying physical causes is necessary. This can then allow stronger explanations, and this is what we want to support with our own instruction.